Hi, and welcome to the end of the weave. So what we're doing for these three weeks is I'm doing the 20th century, but instead of doing it linearly, I'm doing the streams of design within it. Yeah, streams of design. So we sort of did the beginning of this organic craftsman thread, and then we did the constructivists and how they sort of worked within that. And then I'm gonna restart from the 30s in this one, but I'm gonna go in how that organic way rolled forward to become the way in the 90s and 2000s. So I hope you hang with me uh, for this, because here we go for uh, how organicism led to deconstructivism and the value of concept mass theory in contemporary architecture and design. So um, we're sort of making an organic sandwich we talked about um, the, um, the the Art Nouveau period last time and, and its connection to organics. And we sort of talked about how that led to the Prairie School. Um, and this lecture, we're going to start from kind of that spot. And we're going to talk about how there was a branch in the middle of the 20th century that led to... Um, well, last lecture we talked about how like that led to the constructivists and that and now we're going to talk about the other branch which sort of goes by the wayside in the middle of the century and then boom comes back again uh, around about now so <clears throat> this all starts back with Lloyd Wright so we talked about Lloyd Wright and Prairie two weeks ago um, and this is a story that happened back in 1932. So back in 1932, Lloyd Wright starts to do work that is both modern but environmentally aware. And he works on the abstraction of natural forms like we talked about. And he has a lot of a detailed crossover with Art Nouveau in sort of the way things are done. Organic metals and complexity of form and this idea of a connection between what they're doing. And there's sort of a mirroring of that with Gaudi in Spain, if you'll remember from the first lecture two weeks ago. We start talking about organic curvature and we're using structural elements that are ornamental. And that sort of leads up to where we get the structural work of the mid sensory. So this is CIAM, and it gets organized by the Bauhausians that we talked about last time. And we mentioned this in uh, the lecture two weeks ago that Europe gets plastered in World War II. And there are just thousands of buildings that have to be built and rebuilt. And this Council of Traditional Modernists, who are sort of related to the pre-war modernist schools that we talked about, they sort of take over this idea of rebuilding. We've talked about that. And, and they look at the largest planned spaces, and this is their view of the world. Mm. Straight. And the first person to resist these people is this guy called... Aldo van Eyck, and he is like, I am going to form the resistance. We don't have to kowtow to this idea of modernism and blah, blah, blah. And he forms a group called Team 10. And Team 10 is the acorn from which the mighty oak of contemporary design is really born. And they are focused on, and this is what's important. What, what's, I guess not, I don't know. Depends on how much you know me for the rest of your life, but I, I, my work is descendant of this work. I am a design humanist, which means I design, I switched from architecture to interior because I specifically wanted to have more contact with client. I wanted to be more about the people and that's human usage. And that is the sort of direction Team 10 went. So they were starting to look at city planning, not from a what makes a beautiful, clean, straight city way, but rather in a how do people use cities way. 
And they started making these sort of large-scale housing estates because there was a lot of need for housing. And they started dealing with human factors. How does it feel to live here? What do people want? How do people move? And that sort of led to this very different look. And that look is what will become someday concept mass theory, which is what leads to modern deconstructivism. Um, and concept mass theory is letting ideas form the shape of everything. So, back again, 1939, respect for nature. I know this keeps coming back around, coming back around, coming back around. But this is really the divergent point for the last hundred years of architecture. Essentially, falling water is the, the break that creates the two schools, because it is the only building that houses both schools that are seated in the 20th century. So uh, Lloyd Wright invents the word organic architecture, and what he's talking about is a naturalism of materials and a respect for terrain, and the detail comes from Art Nouveau again, and the shapes come into the building sphere, and then they combine all of that with the use of natural materials, and we talked about this, this is Taliesin West, his school, which is all made from materials that came from right there where the building site was, we talked about that before. And these new materials begin to release limitations on shape and form. And sort of that release allows for things we hadn't seen before. Yeah, this project is as much about cantilevers as it is about nature. And that's a new, new-ish technology. Um, around the same time, there's a guy named Bruce Goff. Bruce Goff. And uh, he starts doing a lot more work with mass and form that's really stepping away from... So you have to remember, like, this week's lecture needs last week's lecture to make sense because the things that these guys are rebelling against, that straight, linear, Bauhaus, we are straight stuff, is what all of this is a reaction to. It's in experimental forms that are related to conceptual drive and thought and organically shaped interiors and which you know people rebelled against you know like lloyd wright made perfectly round kitchens and everyone was like kitchens can't be round and you can see this is sort of early concept mass formation this is hundelwasser um he is an austrian but he's very I call him the Austrian Gaudi because he has a lot of the same connections to color and looseness of form. And this is a building that he designed. Um, and you can see, to, like, right now, there's two very famous buildings that were just built in the last five years that are essentially just total ripoffs. Like, Bjark Ingels just stole this building from this guy because he's dead. And he does this organic tile work on the front of these Austrian buildings. And sort of this is like a mass housing thing. Like he's he's experimenting a lot with color and shape and form in ways that people didn't really expect. So there's another guy named Imre Makovats. Makovaz and Makovaz was this guy who um he was Polish, and he did a lot of church work, church work, Eastern European church work, but also not traditionally formed. Also looking at organic structures, like here you see the structure of a wind cage. Here you see the structure of a goofy owl. Okay, not everybody got it right perfectly, but look at his look at his beautiful churches. This is Laurie Baker. Um, who's a dude, <laughs> uh, and he worked in India in the 50s and 60s, uh, specifically with Indian fired brick and with organic shapes that you could build out of brickwork. And here, Bawa did some of the same kind of work. We talked about last time about how he was a little bit of an extension of the prairie school in the way he did that hip roof work, but he also did a lot of connection to nature work. Um, you know, the, the gardens, um, if you guys have been down there. And um, a lot of his other stuff had, had 
strong natural connections. So, um, we talked about postmodernism, and this is about sort of the reactivity to postmodernism from the last week. So, you guys remember Michael Graves, who I talked about how controversial he was because many people found his buildings like crazy ugly. Postmodernism sought the return of ornament and was a reaction against modernism. You can see this is a great... I, I mentioned this in last week's lecture, but I didn't have this slide. Uh, this is Graves reacting to classical catarids by making seven dwarves catarids uh, on this building he did for Walt Disney in California. Um, at the same time, Robert Venturi is working, and he's also working in concept mass form. And so all of those people are sort of the, they're the prelude. They're the beginning of everything. So uh, I want you to take some time to think about those guys a little bit and look at how they sort of set the stage. And then uh, we'll take five minutes now, and then we'll come back, and you can unpause it, and we can come back to um, how deconstructivism came to be. Here we go, with the development of deconstructivism. So, <clears throat> we're still sort of in the historical part, but don't worry, we're about to turn the corner. So let's start with this guy, Peter Eisenman. So again, this is the 80s when the postmodernists are ruling the stage, but the neo-modernists are about to make a comeback, and we begin to get the little edges of the school that's going to outlive them both. Uh, and he starts hanging around with philosopher Jacques Derrida, who maybe you've read his stuff in school. Um, and he starts thinking about how to conceptually break down architecture. And this becomes really important um, because it's sort of the beginning of concept mass theory, the idea that shape and form can be guided by ideas. Um, and these sort of this these two are sort of about the beginnings of getting us there and how buildings can be seen as separate masses that they're going to be on the outside and inside and how com combining and comparing those masses is what makes um, that architectural form come to be. Um, so it's important that, that, that people within this school are connected to and understand construction, but it isn't about the construction the way the constructivists were. It isn't like the international school where it was all sort of everything has to be what it is. It was like it's more what the ideas are about and then we find a way to make the pieces that we want to make to make our ideas work. And so early deconstructivists, early, 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 this is early days with breaking down external forms and taking external form and making it its own art form. And I think this is where we find this connection back to these sort of mid-century artists that we talked about last week. When we talked about cubism and abstract expressionism and surrealism, that finally the same ideas that drove those artistic movements are able to find modes of expression inside of uh, architecture. So structure is both exposed and also ornamental and expressive. Do you guys know this one? This is Cool House's Seattle Library. Um, that you don't have to hide it, but also it doesn't have to just be square, right? That you can look at the same way in which mass, form, and color are expressed in cubism, and express that in architecture as well. And what really makes this possible is computers. Um, so, uh, this would be hard to believe for people in this era, but I am so old that when I went to university, we designed buildings with a pencil. <laughs> like, And that includes the majority of the math it takes to design a building. Like we had 
calculators and some computers, but they weren't very good. Like the computer I had when I was in high school, it had 64K of memory. You guys probably have pencils with more than 64K of memory. One gigabyte of memory by the by 1990, the first time I saw one, was, I don't know, the size of a filing cabinet, roughly. My university had one computer that could do CAD work. It was in the basement, and it filled the entire basement, and you could only get like a half an hour a week on it. So the easier it becomes for you to use computers, the easier it becomes to let those computers do the very hard work of calculating the stresses in much more complex forms. And their ability to work with those heavy layers of complexity allow us to design things that are in turn much more complex. So what used to be considered futuristic design, this is 20s futurism. Um, so somebody drew this as an idea of what the world of the future would look like. And this, is the Sage Center, which is across the street, across the river from NU, if you ever go to NU uh, and see the school that you're graduating from. Uh, this is there, this is Foster. But the, the way in which things that were considered forms that were impossible and drawn as futurist forms have now become very possible and pretty easy, actually. You know, even ideas of the surreal become possible these sort of impossible shapes and weird crossovers and you know even something like this is this is pollock you guys know pollock um uh i, I think i we, we talked about it in the discussion uh, week one discussion how this painting is one and a half joules tall and three joules wide and if you could get deeper into it, you would be able to, you would probably understand its complexity better. But also, you could take this, put it into Max, and start modeling it in 3D, and you would start to get structures like this. The idea that you can make an abstract expressionist structure requires mathematics so complex for its structural integrity that no person could ever do it. It requires multiple algorithms. So this is the difference in our world. And that sets the stage for a world in which it is ideas, not materials and mathematics, that drive the form of buildings. And that is what concept mass theory and deconstructionism are all about. So after 50 years of straight lines, you can finally... Build your imagination. You can decide what you want based on what is possible from physics, not what is possible from this dude you know who, who builds building frames. You got that? I'm so excited. We've made it to, well, modern deconstructivist practitioners by which we'll, we'll talk about the first building at the end, but... The deconstructivist era really begins around 1990, with true deconstructivist buildings beginning in about 1992, um, and persists uh, to this day. So we'll talk about some work from starting 30, 40, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, and ending about 10 years ago. So the, the 20 years from 1990 to 2010, which is the rise of deconstructivism, and we'll talk about some of the more famous buildings and practitioners in there. Oh, sorry about the, there was a bobble cut there. Um, something went wrong. Uh, so this is Lord, 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 Lord Norman Foster, the only person, or well, the first person to really be knighted for service to architecture. Um, and he is very famous, very, very famous. And he does a lot of work with, he, he's a, a deconstructivist and a, a master of contemporary form and incredibly well respected and he's the guy that whenever there's a building that's going to be famous he's at least one of the people bidding on it um he's also a good example of how once you become a famous architect basically even killing you isn't enough to stop you from taking up all the good work it's hard to be a youngin these days so we'll talk about some of the youngins but first let's talk about foster um, uh, Foster develops this, this, the gherkin, uh, which is sort of the beginning 
of London City and the financial district of London. And it works on a different, more complicated structural system. And, and, but, and it allows it to look very different from all the buildings that have been there in the past. And they call it the Gherkin because of not just that it looks like a pickle, but also the underwebbing inside the skin holds, gives it its structural integrity the same way a set of turgid tubes do the inside of a gherkin. And you can see this is, this is uh, the beginning of a library that he designed, we'll talk about in a second. And the inside of that library is based on amoebas, right? So the way a cell wall holds protoplasm on the inside, this sort of skin with these interesting shapes on the inside, leads it to look like this. Even looking at something like an egg, which is a natural form, and biomimicry is a big part of what the deconstructivists really brought into architecture. So you can look at how that modeled something like this, which is the London City Hall, um, which recently turned out to be too expensive to uh, use. <laughs> so people don't uh, use it anymore, uh, but uh, you can see its beautiful form, both inside and out. Um, they looked at the way waves form, and they talked about how the history was a sea beneath something, and that allowed them to make this, which is the roof of the British Museum. He looked at old ideas, so he, he was dealing with, this is for a project in Kazakhstan, he looked at, um, they were a nomadic people that lived on the steps, and he looked at tents and the structure of tents and the way they're held up by tensile forms, and he designed this, which is the uh, opera house for Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan National, Kazakh National Opera. He even looked at traditional structural design, traditional structural design, and sort of looked at how you could modify that into this uh, main train hub. Um, but what he used was the glass palace, which was a very old Victorian British structure. Um, so you can see how Foster is using ideas to drive his work. Um, this man is Daniel Lebskind, and he takes a completely different approach. His process is very different. We've talked sort of every week a little bit about process. His process is very different in that it is much more mathematical. Um, he deals with geometry and mathematics. Um, so every piece he has has this sort of very slashy geometry to it that sort of begins as his inspiration for everything. This is classic Lebskin. Um, he's very famous now because he is the designer of the new tower that replaced the World Trade Center in New York. But uh, you can see how see how he has quite an elegance and complexity to his plans. He allows that geometry to guide everything about the inside of his plans, which in the end even guides its connection between inside and out. This is another view of the same piece we saw first time, but uh, one of the things that's super interesting about it is that uh, there's a, a classic old building next to it, a church, and he uh, doesn't destroy it. He just sort of <laughs> builds building over the front of it, sort of get this broken old and new feel. Um, he also looks at a lot at the math and stress in engineering. See how these parab parabolas form and that stretch forms? And he looked at how that could form the inside of a building. This attractive gentleman who needs to button up his shirt is Koop Himmelbau. Koop Himmelbau. And uh, Koop Himmelbau, uh, he's another, I think he's a Swede. Be Danish. Um, this is his early work, and you can see that he's working on sort of a broken down geometry. 
But that leads him to this, which is his great masterpiece, which I want to talk about, which is the BMW Center in Munich. And he bases, he, he bases that not on the physical form of cars, but on the physics of what happens inside of them, on the torque and tension and pull that happens inside of a car's engine and drivetrain. That's what Himmelbau's work is about. You can see that's a that's a long view of what it looks like or a rendering of it. The idea of that is of those lines of force, of the pull of the car on a skid pad, and the whole thing is based on that sort of rippling, twisting force. And it looks like this on the inside. Can you feel the rippling, twisting force? Doubtless you guys have heard of this guy. Rem Coolhouse? Cool house. Cool house in the house. He is Dutch, um, and he is famous for taking simple ideas and and expressing them and expressing them until he gets to the final form. He takes a tunnel, he builds a tunnel in the sky for a train that's based on the spiraling light in a tunnel that he saw in a cave in France. Um, this is his Maison en Bordeaux, one of his most famous residential projects, and when he starts thinking about it. It's all about this one guy. The guy is in a wheelchair, and so it has this platform that goes up and down in the middle. But his concept is about how that platform is the center of the building. And so he sort of starts with this conceptual drawing of the building spiraling out from the person. And then he starts to abstract that and abstract that and abstract that until he finally ends up with this spiraling interconnected series of walls wrapped around this sort of central platform that comes up and down in the middle. And that's where he sort of gets all this from. Um, he even takes a little bit from fantasy. Um, th these are the plans for an actual building that's in Abu Dhabi. That's what the inside of it looks like. I mean, he's not afraid to call it the Death Star. Like somebody pointed it out to him and he was like, what do you mean? <laughs> but but I, 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 I'm pretty sure he did it all on purpose. Of course, you are all familiar with Zaha Hadid, yes? Um, and she is sort of one of the next level conceptualists and deconstructivists. So, for example, instead of taking materials from the site, she takes inspiration from the site, and she looks at natural forms and how they're made, and then she uses them to design something like this. She looks at a river that's near the city, and she uses it to design something like this. Understanding those flows. Yeah? And even inside, see how that flow of the river engages the interior? Like, this is how deconstructivism works. Idea first. Figure out how to make that idea into a language of shape, form, and color. And then... After that, solve all the math problems later. This is the sound waveform of the sound a bridge makes, <laughs> being made into a bridge made out of waveform shapes. Again, this is this is her London Pavilion. But look at the waveform applications. Um, she also looks at a lot of biomimicry and natural forms. Can you see how that that Natural biomimicry flows into this piece. Look at the way it is in the window lines. And now look at the interior. So, all of this came from one place. There was a single architect who made this transition. Um, and uh, I'm not making this up. When they asked the world's hundred most influential architects what the most important building of their lifetime was. 97 of them named the same building, which is the first true deconstructivist building ever built. And that guy is called Frank Geary. Um, and uh, he is so insanely famous now that 
uh, basically people will pay him just to say his name. There was a famous story. He got a contract nobody can get. Warner Brothers got a hold of that triangular building in Times Square, you know, that's always in the movies. And they wanted to make a whole new building there. And they said, <laughs> Frank Geary, you're the world's greatest architect. We can't live without you. We have to have the greatest building. Please make us a building. And he said, nah. <laughs> and they were like, oh, please, oh, please, Frank, do it. And he said, okay, look, if you give me like $100 million and whatever I draw, you have to build. That's the contract we're signing. You're not allowed to reject it. You have to do what I say. And they were like, oh, yes, 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 you're the greatest architect in the world. Of course, Frank Geary will definitely do it for you. And he discovered a very rare section of the New York Zoning Code that, that said that as long as an object wasn't out over the street for longer than it was like 18 seconds, that it didn't count as being over the street, which I think they made for doors. <laughs> but he designed a building that everything about it swung out over the streets in Times Square in a continuous moving motion. And the price tag on building it was so insane that Warner Brothers choked on it. Um, and then they had to sell the building because contractually they weren't allowed to build anything there unless they did that. Because that's how famous he is. Um, him and Foster compete for the two, like the biggest, like Foster's doing the, the Apple headquarters Geary's doing the Google headquarters. I think Geary also got Amazon, if I remember correctly. Um, okay, so that's Frank Geary. He's the now 30 years later, he's the famousest. But 30 years ago, one day, he is looking at some fish. He's looking at some fish. And he's thinking about fish. And then he gets back to his office and he tells them to bring him some more fish. And everyone's like, more fish? What the fuck is wrong with you? What's with fish? What's with fish? And he draws this sketch. And this sketch becomes the first truly conceptually driven building that was structured after it was designed based on a concept. And that concept is the idea of art swimming through history. And that building becomes the Guggenheim Bilbao, which shows everybody... This is, remember, 30 years ago, this building showed every architect in the world that the rules of the old world are dead and that you can indeed make anything you can imagine. Before this, people had been pushing the edges just a little bit, but, 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 but. but Frank comes along, just drops the bomb on him, changes the entire world for architecture. Everything, all of the other people that I just showed you, those people, except for Foster, live in the shadow of Frank Geary and their careers are a direct response to what he made available to the world of architecture. And he was one of the first real conceptualists who looked at things like natural forces and design buildings. And again, we're looking at stuff, this is early stuff from decades ago. He was light years ahead of everyone back then. He looked at things like the human body and designed pieces like this. <laughs> he just makes sketches about the energy of things and then produce stuff like this. Like I said, he, once Bilbao blows up and every architect in the world is blown away by the fact that the entire world changed while they weren't paying attention, he then becomes so famous that they let him do whatever he wants. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. I've been to good Geary buildings. I've been to bad Geary buildings. Like, I don't think I put a picture in here of the Experience Music Project in Seattle, which is terrible. Oh, he also gets to use crazy stuff. Like, the original Bill Bao was made out of the titanium plates of decommissioned Soviet submarines. Fucking nuts. Um, but he hangs a lot with biomimicry in pieces like this, trying to get the feeling of flight into something the ideas of like interaction with surroundings like his only idea for the next building was that it was looking at all the other buildings like this it's the disney concert hall in los angeles so there are levels to which he's still playing the hits based on bilbao but i think this is a better version of that 
Okay, so what the people they just did are all of the crazy famous people. Like, if you don't know who any of those people are, you definitely should learn them because they're going to get mentioned casually by other people who go to architecture and design school, and uh, they would not expect to have to explain to you who any of the last eight people were, particularly the first and last of those eight. Um, so we're going to stop there for a second. Stop it, stop, stop, stop. And then we're going to come back with some younger, hipper, newer, international places um, uh, to talk about how that sort of has devolved. Okay. Oh, sorry. <coughs> gotcha. Okay. Hi. How you doing? We're back. Um, so here's some newer, younger people. Uh, let's start with Martin Bass. He's Dutch. He graduated from Eindhoven, uh, and he's a furniture designer. And he became famous for this, his smoke series, where he took classic pieces of antique furniture and lit them on fire, um, and then reupholstered them afterwards. This was his graduation show from Eindhoven. Uh, it was, they were so well received that I think eventually Brad Pitt buys them all, and he becomes very famous, and he starts making conceptual furniture like this. This is made of the most expensive wood he could find. Um, and it has been carefully sculpted to look exactly like the cheapest plastic chair that you can buy from China for $3. Um, and it's a discussion of the idea of value. Um, if the form is so cheap, then is it worthless? If I make it of the most expensive things, is it what it costs me that gives it value? And in this, by making the cheapest thing as expensively as possible, he asked this question. It's, a, it's akin to the golden toilet project of uh, two years ago. He, he works on manipulation of preconception. Uh, do you guys remember Ettore Sotsas? So later, after people love the smoke series so much, he starts lighting a bunch of other shit on fire, including incredibly famous pieces of design work like Sotsas's bookcase from the 80s. He's just looking at new ways to consider form. I particularly like this one. In considering what a dresser does, it's just a collection of drawers. So he takes all the drawers, makes them independent, and then cranks them together with a big strap. But all the drawers individually work. So what he's saying is that it is drawers and the form of it makes no sense. Uh, going a completely different direction with the... Euler Wu Collective, they've won a lot of spiffy awards lately. Um, and they do a lot of more geometrically inspired work that are a discussion of the cityscapes around them. Um, and they work in, they're sort of post-functionalists, and they too work in irony. This, for example, is a staircase that works, and its principle of design is it is designed as awkwardly as you could design a staircase like structurally it is the least efficient way to do the job of making stairs and and then they sort of became famous for seeing the space as a canvas so this is a house they designed with a giant turning wall on the inside that can change the form of the rooms um new group emergent architects um they are sort of flirting that organic technological line. So again, we talked about the constructionist and we talked about the organicist, but the thing about the deconstructivists is they can go either way. It just depends on where the ideas take them and what those ideas drive in end form. I mean, a lot of their stuff is based on physics. This, see that whole balanced piece in the middle? That's what that whole piece is about. Simultaneously natural and geometric. Uh, they also do places based on emotion. This was based on the way it feels to sit in front of a fire. They built these giant flames. This was in Melbourne. They built these giant flames. And everyone could come stand around. And um, the idea was the human connection with fire and flame and storytelling. Essentially what they're looking for is living environments. Even though I think this one feels kind of gross once you get underneath it. I mean, ew. But... 
Still ew. No. Uh, this is my favorite bunch of young people nowadays. Uh, the Mad Architects out of China, although they're all in their 30s now. Um, they do amazing work. This is a piece where they took old Chinese paintings of nature and sort of abstracted that painting and then turned it into this this thing called urban forest um they looked at ideas like the human desire to be connected to nature and they built this this is called fake hills they just they recently finished this that's what it looks like close up they wanted to give people the idea of living in a mountain range they even looked at things like falling water which we talked about a bunch and they sort of riffed on that with this multi-cantilever thing, but in a mid-city context. This is the Devil's Tower. They added that to sort of a man-made feel, and they get this fusion of man-made and natural. And this is the spider. <laughs> Which, they just put it in Denmark. <laughs> this giant scary spider. They're like, it's about people's fear of the future. <laughs> but I honestly think that they were just being jerks. <laughs> They're even like, a lot of the stuff that they were doing is even like more dramatic. Like, like if you look at, like, <laughs> like, like, yeah, they weren't afraid to, we talked before, people who aren't afraid to take from fantasy. And they played with scale. This is something they kept proposing. That this, so... Do you remember we talked about arcologies in the first lecture? So this is a relative of arcologies um, in that it was supposed to be a self-contained structure that housed hundreds of thousands of people. And then they just kept sending renderings of it to everybody who was building anything, talking about how this giant star-shaped habitat could be like the thing that everyone lives on. So like in this picture, they've taken all the buildings off the palm in Dubai and said, look, you could fit all those buildings inside the giant star, and then everybody could just have parks all around. Yay for mad architects. Yeah, so they and they and they do a lot of just messing with concept and limits. Like you look at the stretchy beauty of this. So um that sort of brings us to how this is gonna carry us forward and I feel like concept mass theory is the future because the the rules will be even less the more we learn how to make things the less it, it matters that you make things in a way that's makeable and the more people are allowed to make things because they want to make it that way and I think that's where the real interesting ideas come from. This is an idea for floating cities that expand the capacity of cities by sitting offshore and raising their populable area. Superstructures that are possible. Challenging the ideas of what form can be. Imagining new shapes, new areas, new cities. All of that, I think, is going to come from the deconstructivists, who, in some way, concept mass is going to rule for uh, some time to come. If you want to look up somebody, I didn't, I forgot to put him in this thing, I just realized now. Oh, there's a guy called Thomas Heatherick, who's not, not an architect in any way. He's just a designer, a product designer. But he was famous enough that they started just letting him design buildings because there's always someone to do the structure work. And they realized that the more we develop in concept mass, the more we become deconstructivists, the construction part is the engineer's problem. And it's always solvable. So now you, the part that separated architect from designer is getting a, becoming a very thin wall indeed. The idea of what we can and can't do is sort of stretched out at a limit now to what we will 
and won't do. The end. So uh, that was deconstructivism and how concept has led to being the sort of divining force in contemporary architecture that it uh, is. And that basically takes us to the end of the 20th century. Um, although the, those buildings were the ones that were finished that weren't theoretical in there. Uh, I think the most maybe 2009 might be the design date of the the oldest the newest of them um and so uh, this whole series is now we have two more times um so we did the sort of two ends of organicism we put the constructivist in the middle and then we have this kind of end batch now there's two more lectures left and i'm going to separate those into one about architecture and design and one about contemporary art um, and that will finish this series on the art and architecture of the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so I hope you like this. Please, uh, now that it's caught up to almost now, uh, look up some people from now and ask me about them, you know, and we'll talk about it. Um, and that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so thanks for listening. Um, I hope that you develop some great questions for, thir for next Thursday. And I look forward to discussing with you the rise of deconstructivism.